So I touched a little bit on the preoperative risk because I think we see a lot of this in, in our laboratories and Mike Quinones will talk to us about preoperative risk assessment and management. Miguel. Thank you, Bill. And I want to especially thank Dr. Alpe Shah for giving me this wonderful topic. Yeah. Well, it took me longer to prepare than, than this talk than many other fancy talks that I, I do. However, I, I, I'm glad I did because to be honest, we all live with this. This is something we all have to manage almost on a daily basis. Mr. Smith is going for gold bladder. Will you clear him? So let's talk a little bit about that. And the Bible of this, the most recent Bible of this from 2014 are these ACCHA guidelines. Everything you wanted to know is there. However, believe me, it is not bedside reading. Um, actually, it's a bear to read. So I'm very grateful that Dr. Stephen Sisson, who's been involved with this topic for a long time, was kind enough to put some slides in the public domain. So I have no shame in saying that I actually took a few stuff from his slides, <laughs> together with some slides that I did. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sisson. <laughs> All right. So, this is important, why? Because 50% of deaths that are perioperative are cardiac. I mean, that's, that's the real McCoy. That's why this is such an important thing. And they usually happen within those first three days. The peak of the bell curve is 48 hours. Most of them present funny. They're not your classic symptoms because patient is still recovering from surgery. And uh, most of them are non-Q waves or, or non stemmings They also kicked up the mortality of that patient for the next 30 days. So how do we handle these patients? Well, we all go, whether you are aware of not, this is the algorithm we're all using, right? First of all, okay, how risky is the operation you're going to have, right? So we have to cl classify the risk of the surgery. What is the risk of the individual patient for that surgery? And then do I need any further testing? Uh, if I need some testing, which one will I use? And then after I have the data, I have to advise the patient on overall benefit risk for that elective surgery, and do I need to adjust medications? I mean, that's, that's an algorithm we all, whether we have listed in a slide or not, we all go through that. So um, we talk a little bit about this, the cardiac risk. Um, actually, there's some pulmonary conditions that also increase risk, but they, they increase more the risk for prolonging, prolonged extubation, infections, and things like that, which can eventually affect the mortality but still, cardiac is the biggest um, player for perioperative risk. So there are some surgeries that are really very low risk. Endoscopic procedures, superficial procedures, cataract, <coughs> breast surgery, ambulatory surgery. They all tend to have less than a 1% risk of MI or death. Then you have that intermediate to high risk. These are the bigger players, right? The carotid and arterectomies, the big type uh, endovascular repairs, uh, with big stents of an abdo abdominal aortic aneurysm, your head and neck, your intraperitoneal, intrathoracic, big time hip replacement, prostate, aortic major vascular surgeries, and aortic aneurysm, peripheral vascular surgery. These are the real McCoys. These are the ones that, you know, you could throw a few other, other more, but, you know, gallbladder would be in the intraperitoneal, although nowadays with the laparoscopic, they have really dropped the risk a lot. And why is that classification important? Well, because as you can see, in this very nice paper, by the way, this is for in, the, in the Journal of Primary Care. It's written by a primary care group from uh, Mayo Clinic. The high risk has uh, over 5% probability of bad things happening. Intermediate between one and five, and your low risk procedures, less than 1%. So that's why that initial classification of surgical risk of the operation itself is so important. So, we have established a little bit of the risk of the surgery. Now, what is the risk of Mr. Smith, who is sitting in front of us? Well, there have been a hundred different algorithms um, for risk classification. This one is the one that is, seems to be now sticking as being the most commonly advised by the guidelines and also relatively easy to use. So it gives one point for each of these things, cerebral vascular disease, congestive heart failure, creatinine levels that are ele elevated, diabetes requiring insulin, ischemic heart disease, non-ischemic heart disease, or big-time surgery, you know, 
the, the, the surgeries that we just listed as being high risk. So one point for each of them. And why is it important? Well, look at this. Zero points, very low risk. One point, 0.9, although in some studies it goes from 0.3 to 2.1, but the average of all these studies is about 0.9. But once you hit two or more, it starts kicking up. So the bottom line here is, once you are over one point in here, you are now in a potential for much more higher risk of perioperative cardiac complications. And like everything in life, there are apps, and this is one that is available for doing the same thing, you know, just remembering and quick, quick doing the checking. The other thing that's very helpful is functional assessment, which you, you do not need any testing. Just talk to the patient. Why? It's another important indicator of risk. So if somebody has a poor tolerance to exercise, less than four meds, they're in trouble. They will also have a higher risk for problems. And you don't need fancy testing because if the patient sitting in front of you cannot climb one flight of stairs or walk up a hill or walk for four, at, a, at a rate of four miles per hour, run a little bit, scrub floors, go dancing, have a good time, have normal, you know, have, uh, be sexually active, all those things are things that tell you they are at over four meds. Otherwise, they're in trouble. They're very sedentary. They're less than four meds. And why is it important? Because once you are under four meds, also the risk increases. And this is one time where if you have a doubt in talking to a patient, a little simple exercise treadmill could help you. But in that case, I would suggest you order it with a modified Bruce protocol not with the intensive Bruce protocol, which is made for ischemic heart disease testing. We can modify the protocol to be a little bit more gentle, and it's better to assess the actual tolerance of a patient. And it, at times, you might need it, because you cannot get a good handle just by talking to the patient. And this is important because a lot of studies have shown that less than four meds increases significantly the risk for perioperative problems. Likewise, if somebody has very high functional tolerance, those are very good points for low risk. I put together this slide summarizing because I think this, this can really help you and you will have all these slides available for yourself. So if you combine the revised cardiac risk index, which you can have in your, in your iPhone, and the functional capacity, if somebody has a one or less risk index over four meds, they basically, you can clear them. You know, you might want an EKG, I'll talk to you later, I'll, I'll mention EKG in a minute. But in essence, most, most patients can handle an operation with that. Likewise, if they have a low functional capacity or, and or higher, more than one, now you might need some help, okay, from other tests. So this can really help you set your mind because not everybody needs a lot of testing. What are the tests? Well, EKGs, echoes, stress testing. Cardiac cast, I mentioned it just to simply say X is never indicated. So I'm going to skip this slide because I think the next one is a lot helpful. It says the same thing, but in a little diagram, if I can get it to happen. Okay. Here we go. All right. So you start with your history and physical examination. Okay. There are no signs of, system, of, of, of cardiovascular disease. Risk is low, you're done. You, don't, you may not even need an AKG. In fact, if you have the low risk that I mentioned in the previous slide, and the operation is even intermediate, you may not even need an EKG. Now, we all do EKGs, right? That's the reality, let's be honest. But the problem with doing an EKG is the following. I get a lot of consults on people who are totally healthy from a primary care doctors because the EKG had a right bundle or left axis deviation. You know what the risk for perioperative problems with a right bundle or left axis deviation? Zero. In other words, no further increase to anything else that we talk about. But now you have a finding. Now the patient is worrying about the EKG. Now they go to see the cardiologist. And now as a cardiologist, you say, well, you know, maybe I should do an echo. And now you're taking a whole increased cost, worrying to a patient, and at the end it's going to be clear no matter what. So that is the problem with EKGs that we all tend to do. Because, you know, I have a left, left axis deviation. I'm 74, I'm perfectly healthy. So I don't think I would need an EKG. 
to be clear for an operation. So here's the issue with the EKG. Even though we all overdo it, that's the problem that we get by doing EKGs. And if you look at the guidelines, they actually tell you that patient is doing so well, the EKG is not going to tell you anything to unclear, okay? Even a left bundle, if the patient passes those tests, you know, most likely be okay. Left bundle could be the only one thing that perhaps uh, you might want to do something else. So these are the guidelines. I agree that we all tend to ignore them and we all tend to do a lot of EKGs, but we get into that problem with EKG that we then have to chase uh, a finding. All right, echoes, very important. So, preoperative echocardiography. Dr. Zogby hinted on that. I can get this to work. Routine preoperative evaluation is not recommended, period. Now, if somebody already has been known to have an EF of 37%, and they're perfectly stable, and their last echo was six months ago, you do not need an echo. Now, you might consider an echo if the last echo was done two years ago. So they basically give about a year window that if you know, have not had reevaluation in one year, you may want an echo. Perfectly stable patient. We're talking about somebody with LV dysfunction but who is actively doing well. So when is it that an echo really is needed? Patients with dyspnea or suggestion of decompensated heart failure, which you would want an echo no matter what, abnormal EKG, without a previous workup, and that's when now you, you get into the problem that I mentioned earlier, you, you get the EKG, now you start chasing the EKG, or suspicion of valvular heart disease, which of course means murmurs that suggest valvular heart disease. Those would be your typical indications for an echo. What about stress testing? So, um, oh, this is going to kill me here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Might be better if we use our own laptops. Okay, so the stress EKG I mentioned, it can help you at times establish functional capacity when you're not sure by talking, uh, from talking with the patient. Um, now, the nuclear stress, I, we usually do them with pharmacologic, usually because we're now dealing with people that are going for a bigger surgery. And most people who are going with, to a bigger surgery already are limited by whatever symptom they have and they may not be able to go on a treadmill. I mean, that's, that's the main reason for pharmacology. If a patient still can go on a treadmill, I still prefer treadmill. But most of the time, these people now are older, they're having a hip replacement, they, they're not going to be able to go to first base on the treadmill. So we end up with a pharmacologic. And you have the choice of adenosine, regadenosine, nuclear versus dobutamine stress echo. My own bias, I like nuclear better, but it's a bias. I, the first one to to mention that. Both can be used, there's good data on both of them. I'm going to skip this because I think this slide is better. So we go back to this slide and if somebody appears to be on the higher risk, i.e. they have more than one point in the RCRI score and or they flung functional capacity and they have the risk factors, they're your typical patient you're concerned about from the CAD point of view, I think a, a pharmacology stress test would be indicated. Usually pharmacology, because if they have a low functional capacity, they're not going to get to first base on a treadmill. So I think that same slide we used before, we could use to guide ourselves for when a nuclear stress test is needed. So let's talk about specific risk. Ischemic heart disease, heart failure, valvular hypertension, and arrhythmias. So ischemic heart disease, basically, patient is stable, completely stable. They had an MI a year ago, but they're perfectly stable. They have a low risk stress nuclear. Maybe they had it six months ago, that's good enough. You don't have to repeat another one, okay? You can go ahead and clear them, okay? Now, if they meet the criteria we said before, you do this, the nuclear stress, and they flunk the nuclear stress, then you have to take a pause, of course, and get help from the cardiologist. If they have acute symptoms, class two or three angina, or they have a perfusion defect of 30%, you have to postpone surgery and reassess, obviously. That's not a patient you're going to send for elective operation. Cardiac cast has no role, unless it's being done for symptoms, different. But just as a pre-op checkup, cardiac cath is not indicated. We talk about the antiplatelets, and the guidelines recommend still that for drug eluding stents, to delay surgery for a year if it's elective. 
However, if it's pseudo-elective and at urgent need, there's been a little bit of debate for recent studies, Dr. Clement showed, showed you that, that maybe six months might be okay. But again, this is an area where you really, at that point in time, want to have a good discussion with the cardiologist and the patient and, and make a combined decision as to, is the operation so important that we may want to do it a little earlier and take the risk of having to stop uh, that. So that's, that's an area, you're not, that's a decision you guys are not going to do alone. Uh, we frequently are involved and, and help with those uh, decisions. Heart failure, likewise, if the patient is very stable, class one or two, taking their medication, the risk is very low. And you can proceed once you follow the algorithm that I just discussed. If they have dyspnea, if they are still symptomatic, you may want to take a pause and get further evaluation. That's where an echo can be very helpful. You may want to know their pulmonary pressures and where they're sitting to decide whether that operation should be done. So the compensation is always a reason to stop and think stable patient may undergo the surgery. But this is when you really want to be in a center that has all the experts to manage. We're all very lucky that we practice here. But this is an area where you really want to have a lot of help, experts helping. Babular heart disease is very similar. You obtain the echo if you're suspicious, but if patient is known to have aortic stenosis, moderate AS, very stable, most of the time they can do very well with surgery as long as they're in a center that can manage all their complications. Arrhythmias are not a problem. Atrial fibrillation can be managed. You don't have to stop operation with that. It's just a matter of dealing with the anticoagulation. PVCs, PACs, all those arrhythmias, not a problem. They have not been known to increase risk much. Uh, so they're usually not a problem. The only problem is if people have pacemakers and ICDs, that's when you do want help from a cardiologist in establishing if anything should be done uh, before the operation. Um, Pulmonary risk, basically, we all know that people that have low FEV1s FEV are going to be at higher risk for intubation and whatnot. Interesting, low serum albumin is the best predictor of perioperative pulmonary complications. Actually, that was an interesting pearl. It's the fact that keep an eye on the serum albumin. I'm not going to go through this. You can read it on your own. These are some of the recommendations that are given for medications adjustment. And likewise, I'll let you read through this which are the most recent recommendations for beta blockers. Notice that there's only one class one. If the patient is already in a beta blocker and stable, continue it. But to start beta blockers, they're all class twos, okay? The biggest peril here is if you're going to start beta blocker, start it for a week or so before, not the day before, because you want to have a window of time you know the patient can do okay with beta blockers. Some people get very bradycardic with beta blockers. So you don't want to start it one day before. It's always better to give them some time to have it so that you can address any possible side effects or toxicity. And I think that might be my last slide. Oh. Anyway, yeah, basically we're done here. Um, this is just summarizes. You have your clinical risk factors that guide you for further testing and decision, and you have your contraindication for surgery where you really should stop, think, and reassess. Thank you very, very much.